you to think about that. That's the standard. That's a high bar for forgiveness. We are to forgive one another in the same way that God has forgiven us. And so it would really do us a lot of good to think about how God has forgiven us because that's exactly how I need to forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me. And so that's what, exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at how God forgives, and then we're going to try and make application of that to our own lives in our relationships one with another as we forgive one another of transgressions. You know, in any group setting, especially um, to speaking here of congregational, but any group setting, sometimes people get on one another's nerves, and sometimes they rub one another the wrong way, and sometimes we aggravate one another. And this verse is telling us that we need to learn the, the art of forgiveness uh, because that's the way God has been with us. He's forgiven us and so we need to be that way with one another. We can't fall out over every little difference and over every little slight and over every little thing. Uh, we need to learn to get along. We need to learn to forgive one another. So let's dig into this. Let's talk about how God forgives us and then make application to how we forgive one another. First of all, the Bible teaches us that God forgives willingly willingly. Uh, he's not grudging about it at all. Turn, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, and here in this text, uh, there is a rehashing of the history of some of the children of Israel, uh, and some of the things that they did, the way they lived. And, you know, as you go through the Old Testament, you learn that what he says here in these verses is very true. Uh, Israel was stubborn and obstinate and rebellious against God and they continued to go back into idolatry and always constantly uh, testing God and taxing his patience. But notice there it says in verse 16, but they and our fathers acted proudly. Our fathers here, reference to the Israelites. They hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. Now let's just stop there. When he's talking about that, that's when they got upset and they wanted to go back to Egypt. You know, Moses had just delivered them from Egypt, and they're out there in the wilderness, and they got so fed up with being out in the wilderness, they said, let's just get us a leader and let's go back to slavery. We'd rather be back in slavery. That's how stubborn and obstinate and rebellious they were. But look at the rest of verse 17. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. That is our God right there. And notice, that, by the way, that's an Old Testament scripture. I hear sometimes people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. And the God of the Old Testament was very vindictive. That doesn't sound vindictive to me. That doesn't sound like a wicked God to me. It sounds like the same God I read about in the New Testament. It sounds exactly the same. He is ready to pardon. That means that he's willing. God is willing. He wants to forgive you. He would much rather forgive you than send you to hell. Believe me when I say that. That's what the Bible is teaching. He would much rather forgive you than to send you to hell. He's gracious. He's ready. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He has to be. When you think about those Israelites and how often they went back into sin, God has to be uh, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, you see, and he did not forsake them. God stayed with his people and tried to get them to come back. He worked with them for many, many centuries, and that tells us that God forgives very willingly. In the New Testament, we have a very similar principle in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. I just want to show you that this is universal. It's across both Testaments, Old and New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, we know the verse very well. Peter says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Now let me stop there. The promise here that he speaks of is the promise to destroy the world. The world is going to be destroyed. He's made a promise that he's going to come back, and when he comes back, he's going to destroy the world. That's why I get tickled at all these uh, climate change activists. That, oh, we've got to save the planet. You're not going to save it. It's doomed. It's going to be destroyed, and it's not going to be destroyed by the climate. It's going to be destroyed by the Lord himself. Understand that. Get it in your head. The planet is doomed, but God is not slack concerning his promise. He's not forgotten, even though it's been 2,000 years since Christ came. He's not forgotten his promise, and so he's not slack as some people count slackness. Well, what's he waiting on? He's long-suffering. There it is. Long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God forgives willingly. I want you to repent. I've heard people, I've had this question over and over down through the years. What is God waiting on? Look how wicked the world is. It gets more wicked all the time. What's he waiting on? Waiting on you. 
Waiting on you to repent. Now, he's not going to wait forever. Understand that. He's not going to wait forever, but he's waiting on you because he's willing, more than willing, to forgive you. One of the greatest illustrations of this is in the parable of the prodigal son. Look at this in Luke 15. We won't read the whole thing, but we'll read a good chunk of it. Luke chapter 15, Jesus actually told three parables about lost things. But the greatest and most memorable of those parables is the parable of the prodigal son. Actually, that's a parable about two sons. And we'll talk about both those sons here in just a minute. But one son demanded his inheritance early. Dad, I want mine now. I don't want to wait till you're dead. I want it now. And he took his money and he took off to a far country and he blew it all. And he, he had nothing. I mean, nobody would even help him. That's how, that's how low down he got. And he blew it all on sin. But the father more than willing to forgive, and this father represents God in the parable, more than willing, he's waiting and watching and hoping that boy will come home. And that brings us to Luke 15 and verse 20. And he arose, this is the boy, the first boy, he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, way off in the distance, you see, his father saw him. Oh, that's my boy. I've been waiting on him. I've been wanting him to come home. He had compassion and he ran to him and fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Now stop right there and notice something. Earlier in the parable, I didn't read it, but earlier in the parable, that was part of the boy's confession. But the boy also said, he, he was going to tell his father, make me like one of your hired servants. Before the boy could get those words out, the father stopped him. And he said, that's, that's good right there. The father said to his servant, bring out the best robe. And put it on. You're not going to be like one of my hired servants. You're my son. You're my son and you've come home. Bring out the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. All these passages, the one in Nehemiah and the one in 2 Peter and the one here in Luke 15, they tell us that God is willing to forgive. How about you? How about me? You see, that brings us to the other son. We forget the other son in the parable of the prodigal son. The other son is what you and I sometimes do. The other son was not willing to forgive. Let's read on here in verse 25. Now the older son, oh, don't forget about that fella. The older son was in the field and he came and he drew near the house and he heard music and dancing. He's like, what's all this about? So he called one of the servants and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, verse 27, your brother has come. And because he's received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. Is that you? Is that you when somebody comes home? When somebody repents? When somebody returns? Is that you? Do you get angry? He was angry and would not go in. And therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, and I've never transgressed a commandment of yours at any time. He just lied right there. There ain't a child on the face of the earth that ain't transgressed a commandment of his parents. We've done it. I've done it. You've done it. Every one of us have done it. Sure you have. Sit there and say, I've never trans... Baloney. I've never transgressed a commandment of yours. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours who came, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. I hope that doesn't describe you. And I hope it doesn't describe me, but it does describe some. I've seen brethren like this. Someone has been out in the world and someone has left the Lord and, and they've been living in sin and they come forward and they make things right. And you know what we do? Do you know what that guy did? I can't believe that church took him back. I can't believe. Do you know what he did? He did this and he did this. And we start talking about it. That's not forgiving as God forgave, is it? God drops it and he forgives willingly. You come back and I'm more than willing to accept you back. Not on probation, but as my son. And, and this is the way we should forgive one another. Just as God forgave you. That's how we should forgive one another. Let's not be like that other son, like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. Let's not be like him, but let's forgive willingly. But I noticed something else here. God forgives aggressively. Aggressively. And what this means is God, he takes great pains to try and forgive you. He's going to bend over backwards to try and forgive you if he can. In fact, when you think about the redemption, the, the scheme of redemption, God made the first move. You ever go back in the book of Genesis? I didn't put this in my notes, but if you go back to the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve first sinned, God immediately, 
put in motion the plan of salvation. Now we know from other scriptures he already had that in his mind. That was from the, before the foundation of the world. He already had that in his mind. But as immediate, God didn't wait one second. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, he talked about that seed of woman who would come and crush the head of the serpent. God was aggressive and immediately began to instigate the plan of salvation. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll start the reading in about verse 18. The Apostle Paul talks about God's work of reconciliation. In verse 18, all things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now stop and think about that for a second. You and I are the ones who left. You and I are the ones who left. And God was aggressive. I'm going to do something to bring man back reconciling God, I'm going to take the action. I'm going to be involved in this. I'm not going to sit back and wait for him to come begging to me. I'm going to reach out and I'm going to aggressively seek forgiveness. And so here we are, the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 18, that is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. That's just a fancy way of saying forgiving them. Because when you don't impute sin, you've forgiven them of their sin. And therefore, they are in fact righteous because that sin is gone. It's forgiven, you see. And so not imputing their trespasses to them and is committed to us. The us here is the apostles. Committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we, the apostles, are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. You see, they were spokesmen. They were his ambassadors. We implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. God is aggressive and he sent out his messengers and he sent out his prophets and he sent out his apostles. I want you to come home. I want you to reconcile with me. I want you to be reconciled. For he made him who knew no sin to be a sin offering for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so God made the first move and out of pure love, God sent his son to be the sacrifice for sin. Romans 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That death of Jesus on the cross is God's demonstration of love. We're going to take this Lord's Supper in a little while when I get done talking. And I want you to think about that because when you eat that bread, that's the body, that represents the body of Christ hung on that cross for your sins. Broken, broken open and broken down to the point of death for your sins. And that cup, that fruit of the vine represents his blood that was shed. This was the aggression. This was the action God took. I want you back with me. I want you back home. I want you back in a relationship with me. I'm more than willing and I will aggressively act. I will send my son to die on the cross for your sins. Now, just as God forgave you. When we talk about forgiving one another, we need to be aggressive about it. Sometimes we're not so aggressive. And we don't work as hard as we should at being reconciled one with another uh, when we have a falling out with someone. In, in Matthew 5, and we're going to look at a couple of verses here. So hold your spot in Matthew 5, and that will be verse uh, 24 in just a second, 23 and 24. And then also Mark Matthew 18. I want you to see both of these together. Matthew 5 and Matthew 18, verse 15. But let's start with the Matthew 5 passage. Matthew 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar. Remember the other night I was telling you that a lot of what Jesus said here had to do with the law of Moses. Right here is an example. Bring your gift to the altar. We don't bring our gift to the altar today. There is no altar today. That was your Judaism. That was Judaizing type of worship. And, but he's saying basically, if you come to worship... That's what he's saying. If you're coming to worship, you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember your brother has something against you. You're the wronger doer here. He's got something against you because you've wronged him. Jesus says in the next verse, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I got another sermon I preached called Don't Even Bother. Don't even bother. And one of the points is, don't even bother to worship God if you've got a problem with your brother. Don't bother. That's what Jesus is saying right here. Don't bother. Leave your gift. Don't you even bother trying to bring that gift and bring it before me. First, you go be reconciled with your brother, and then you come and you offer your gift. Then you come and worship me after you fix things with your brother. That's how important this is. That's talking about being aggressive. It's not waiting. Oh, I'll wait. I'll wait two or three weeks. No. Now. Now. Leave your gift. Don't even bother to worship. First be reconciled to your brother. Now Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, this time he's the wrongdoer. 
That's the reason I wanted you to see both these passages. In Matthew 5, you were the wrongdoer. Your brother has something against you. You did something to him, you see. In Matthew 18, your brother sins against you. He's the wrongdoer. I've seen brethren, sometimes they get in this little game. And he'll say, well, I'm not going to go to him. He got to come to me. And the other over here saying, well, I'm not going to go to him. He got to come to me. And they're both going to pout themselves right straight into hell. That's exactly what's going to happen. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. The Lord says, if your brother wrongs you, go. And if you wrongs your brother, go. Doesn't make any difference. Who did it? Doesn't make any difference whose fault it is. Both of you need to go. And ideally, as that old song is, you meet in the middle. Ideally, you will meet right in the middle. I was on my way to see you. Well, I was on my way to see you too. Can we work this out? Can we fix this? That's aggression. That's getting at it. That's not waiting. That's not letting it stew. That's getting to it. Getting down to business. Let's get this worked out. Let's forgive one another. And when things are patched up, then forgive. While you're in Matthew 18, drop down just a little bit further. Verse 21. Peter came and he said, Lord... How often? How often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? I'm sure Peter thought that was generous. That's a lot. Seven times? And Jesus said, I don't say you up, up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And that's what's called a hyperbole, an exaggeration to make a point. Jesus doesn't literally mean 490 times and on the 491st time he's toast. That's not what that means. Jesus is using the exaggeration to show that this is so much of a bigger number than what you suggested. You need to be aggressive, and if your brother is going to rec reconcile and make things right, then let's forgive. Let's get this over with. He told that parable about forgiveness. And he said, we need to be like that. In fact, dropping down here to the end, verse 35, so my heavenly Father will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother that's trespasses. You need to be aggressive. Get down to business. Get this done. Don't, if we're to forgive as God forgave, then when there's a problem, you need to get it fixed and get it fixed now. Don't wait. Don't put it off and don't let it stew. That's what it means to forgive as God forgave. But not only that, but God forgives completely. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verses 10, 11, and 12. And don't you love these words, especially verse 10? Look at this. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad? Well, if God gave me what I deserved, I know where I'd be, and I don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't want to be there. I don't want to go there. I don't want to wind up in that place called hell. And he says, God has not dealt with us according to our sins. Aren't you glad? nor has he punished us by our iniquities. Verse 11, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, and the idea is those are opposites. East is completely this way, and west is completely that way. They're just opposite, total opposites, total opposite ends of one another. So far he has removed our transgressions. Completely total. They're gone. They're from this side where they were with you, and they're clear over here, gone away from you on the other side. That's how far he's moved your transgression. He forgives completely. And God does this with every single sin. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, and this is a great promise that's given to the Christian. John reminds us, he says, if just for a little context in verse 8, he reminds us that we all, do, we all still sin from time to time. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Even Christians sin. He's writing there to Christians. Even Christians make mistakes. But verse 9 says, if we confess our sins. Notice that. There's a condition. We'll talk more about that later. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? Some unrighteousness? No. Most unrighteousness? No. All unrighteousness. Completely. It's gone. It's gone, you see. That's the idea. When we forgive one another... What did he say? Just as God in Christ's sake forgave you, when we forgive one another, it can't be halfway. And sometimes we do that. We put our brethren on probation. Well, let's just wait and see. I'm withholding my forgiveness. Let's just wait and see. No, wait a minute. You can't do that. You can't put them on probation. You've got to forgive completely. And sometimes we're willing to forgive some things but not others. Just as an illustration here. <clears throat> 
Somebody comes back, they've not been attending as they should. Oh, we'll cry for that. We'll, we'll hug them. Oh, we're glad you're back. We're glad we'll hug them. We'll cry. But, but this time, I'm not going to forgive because he hurt me personally, you see. And so we pick and choose sometimes. We, I, I'll forgive the lack of attendance, fine. But, but he hurt my feelings, and I'm not going to forgive that. It can't be that way. All transgressions, remove it far away. Forgive completely is the idea, you see. We, we have to forgive just as God forgave. And so this is, you see how practical this is? We know what God has done for us. We talk about it all the time. But let's just think about it here for a second and let's apply that to one another. Let's apply that to one another. Forgiving one another willingly. I'm more than willing to forgive you. Forgiving one another aggressively. I want to seek you out. I want to make this right. Forgiving one another completely, it's all gone. Every bit of it. I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. I'm not going to put you on probation. It's gone. But not only that, God forgives permanently. Turn to Hebrews chapter 8. In Hebrews 8, we have a big, extensive quote from Jeremiah 31. In fact, if you're looking at Hebrews 8, from about verse 8, about middle ways through the verse where it says, Behold, the days are coming, all the way down to the end of verse 12. All of that's a quotation from the Old Testament. Every bit of that, if you have a New King James, it's probably marked off and set off as a quotation from the Old Testament. And he's quoting Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33, if I remember correctly. But he's talking about the, the nature of the New Covenant. That's the whole gist of the book of Hebrews, the difference between the Old Covenant and the New. And here he's talking about the difference between the Old and the New. And it's in verse 7, for instance, he says, If the first covenant, that's the Old Testament, if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been found for a second, the New Covenant. Well, what could be wrong with the Old Covenant? Be very careful here. It wasn't, there wasn't nothing wrong with the laws of the Old Covenant. It was the people. It was the people. Look at this in verse 8. Because finding fault with them. Did you see that? Finding fault with them. The people. They were the fault. They were the problem. They didn't keep the law perfectly. They broke the law. Finding fault with them, you see, that was the problem with the first covenant. The people of the first covenant was the problem. He says, Behold, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them. He says it's not like the old law. You see that, that one when he led them out of Egypt, that's the old law. That's the Ten Commandments. That's the old covenant you see. It's not like that one he says. For this, verse 10, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. God says, my law is going to be a part of who you are. It's going to be ingrained in your very character, in your hearts and in your minds. None of them will teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. You know, under the old law, you were born into the covenant as a Jew, and then you were taught to know the Lord. In the new covenant, it's just reversed. You're taught first, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and then you're born, born again. Born of water and the Spirit, you see. So it's different. It's not like the old covenant. None of them will teach his neighbor and none his brother, for they'll all know the Lord. You can't be part of the covenant unless you know the Lord, unless you know the truth. And here it comes in verse 12. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Permanently. Permanently. Permanent forgiveness. That brings up the old adage. We hear it all the time. Forgive and forget. Forgive and forget. Now let me teach you a little lesson about words here. You can't erase your memory. Now brethren struggle with this. I can't, I can't get it out of my mind. Of course you can't. You can't erase your memory. God doesn't erase his memory either. Well, he says he, never, he will not remember their sins anymore. What does that mean? Let's think about that a little bit. I know God actually remembers their sin. How do I know? Well, unless, God, unless you're going to tell me God doesn't know what's in here. This tells me David sinned. Who wrote this? God knows David sinned. God knows David committed adultery. God ain't forgot that, literally. He ain't erased it from his memory. It's right here. Paul sinned when he persecuted the church. How do you know? It's right here. Who had that recorded? God did. He didn't erase his memory. You can't erase your memory. You can't, and God can't. 
He didn't erase his memory. What it means is when you forget it, I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. That's what that means. It's gone. It's permanently forgiven. I will not bring that up again. Now that's where it comes down to the test, isn't it? I'm not going to bring that up again. I'm not going to hold it over you anymore. It's water under the bridge. It's old news. It's old news with God. And when we forgive one another, it should be old news with us. There's a passage. I didn't put this in my notes. Let's see if I can find it. 1 Corinthians 13. But 1 Corinthians 13, remember, it talks about the characteristics of love. And one of those, in verse 5, I think it is, the New King James says, and it's the last one in verse 5, thinks no evil, thinks no evil. But I believe, and Keith, you can nod your head, in the New American Standard Version, it says, keeps no record of wrongs or something like that. Is that about what it says? Something like No account. No account of wrongs. That's what that really means. Think no evil. I'm not keeping a record. You know, that would be a good lesson for us. Because what happens is, oh, I forgave you. But the next time he does something, here comes the list. When you roll it all, it goes all the way back of the house. Well, I remember what you did to me yesterday and 10 years ago and 20 years ago, and I ain't forgot any of it. Well, that ain't going to work because love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love lets it go. I'm not going to hold it over against you anymore. I'm not bringing that up again. It's gone. That's what it means to forget it. I'm not going to hold it against you. It's water under the bridge. It's old news. That's how God forgives us. And that's how we ought to forgive one another. You know, all of these things are easy to say. It's the doing that gets hard, isn't it? It's the doing that's hard. Easy words to say, but it's the doing that's hard. But this is what the Bible is requiring of us when it says to forgive as God forgave. It means I forgive willingly. It means I'm aggressive, seeking it out. It means I forgive completely. And it means I forgive permanently. One more point we want to make here. It also means that I forgive conditionally. So that's what God does. God cannot simply ignore sin and call it forgiveness. You know, I think that's what some people think. They think God just ignores sin and he calls it forgiveness. No, God never ignores sin. There has to be conditions met on man's part in order to have the forgiveness of God. In Luke the 13th chapter in verse 3, Jesus was actually, just to put him in context, he was actually talking about a, a disaster that had occurred uh, in, fact, in fact, he talked about two of them in the context here. Uh, two disasters that had occurred in their day. Verse 1, for instance. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. There had been a great big massacre. Pilate had instigated a massacre and he'd mingled the blood of these people with their sacrifices. That was a terrible tragedy. And Jesus said, do you suppose that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? That was a terrible tragedy. you think it was because they were worse sinners? Jesus said, nope, not because they were worse sinners. In fact, I'll tell you this, unless you repent, you'll likewise perish. Conditions, conditions. Here's another tragedy, verse 4. How about those 18 on people on whom the tower of Siloam fell? Fell, excuse me, I said fell, fell. And just what popped in my mind as I read that. Think about those wildfires on the island of Maui out there in Hawaii. Think about it. What about that? What about the 18 people who died when this tower fell? What about these tragedies? Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other who dwelt in Jerusalem? Nope. They're not any worse sinners than anybody else. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. He's saying, I forgive conditionally. I'm not just going to ignore your sin and call it forgiveness. God has always made forgiveness conditional. On the day of Pentecost, when the people that were gathered on that occasion heard Peter's sermon and they were pricked in their hearts, they said to Peter and the other apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Why well, don't do anything? Now, that's not what he said. He said, Repent. That's a condition. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Two conditions actually in that verse. Repentance and baptism. Both of them have to be met before they will have the remission of sins. And then... Later on, a Christian sinned. His name was Simon, Simon the sorcerer. He had been converted to Christ in Acts 8. Let's just flip over there and take a peek at that. Acts chapter 8, and we'll start with verses 12 and 13 because that shows us that Simon was converted to the Lord. Acts 8, 12 and 13, when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. And Simon himself also believed. 
And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's what these people did. They believed and they were baptized, so they're saved. Even Simon. And then Simon falls back into sin. And he tries to buy the, the gift that the apostles had so that he could pass on the Holy Spirit just like the apostles could. And Peter said to him in verse 20, Your money perish with you, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. This was a man who was saved, and now his heart is not right. He's gone back into sin. And he says, verse 22, Repent. There it is. Repent and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. Conditionally. God never forgives unconditionally. There's always conditions. What about you and I? Same thing. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Notice, if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him conditionally, just as God forgave you, you see. So we forgive one another on conditions. If my brother repents, then I forgive, you see. Now, some people take that and run with it. Well, that means if he doesn't repent, I can hold a grudge. Oh, wait a minute. No, you can't. You're not allowed to hold a grudge. He may need to come and he may need to make confession. He may need to make things right, but you can't hold a grudge. Turn your Bible to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. God is watching you. Don't you think for a second, yeah, your brother needs to repent. There's no doubt about it. But don't you think for a second that you can hold bitterness and grudge in your heart and be pleasing to God. Don't you grumble against one another, brethren. The judge is standing at the door. God is watching you. You, are, you don't have the right to hold the grudge. You do have the right to say, I'll forgive you when you repent. But you don't have the right to hold the grudge, you see. As I wrap this all up, just look at that bottom line. May we all go and do that likewise. You see, this is how God forgives, willingly and aggressively, completely, permanently, and conditionally. And it says we forgive one another just as God forgave you. May we all do what God has done, what God has done for each one of us. That's a high standard, isn't it? I, I never said it was easy, but that is what the Bible teaches. How do you measure up? I can't examine your life for you. You have to examine your own life, and I have to examine mine. How do you measure up to this? That's a pretty high bar, isn't it? But let's learn the lessons here, and let's put them into practice in our lives. Take out your songbooks, if you will, please, and turn to the song of invitation. 274. Softly and tenderly. You know, Jesus does call us. The Bible talks about us being called. We're, we're the called of God. But he doesn't call us through... Uh, some mysterious voice or, or through some, uh, what some people call the direct operation of the Holy Spirit or some feeling run, running up and down your spine. He calls us through the gospel. That's how the Lord calls us. And it says here, softly and tenderly. God is not really wanting to express anger to us. He's wanting to express mercy and grace and forgiveness. And he calls to us softly and he calls to us, please come home. Please come home. I want you to come back to me. I want you to be my child. I want you to be faithful. If you're here this morning, God is calling to you as well. And he's calling softly and tenderly through the words of the gospel. I sent my son to die for you. Please come back to me. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess his name and be baptized. And if you've already done that, then be like Simon the sorcerer. Repent of this wickedness and pray God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. If you need us to, we'd be happy to pray with you and pray for you if that should be your desire. Please come while we stand and while we sing.